Oh, Saul. That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 8. Well, we left with the death of Stephen, and Acts 8 starts off right away. Saul approved of his execution. I don't know if it was approved as, I am in charge of this, and I approve, or I was like, yeah, take that. In the commentaries, they mentioned that the word approved here meant consenting. He was certainly a part of the persecution. Then it, it says arose a great persecution in the church. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and lamented over him. Obviously, what a, what a great guy Stephen was. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house to house as he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And in Acts 1.8, Jesus told his followers to bring the gospel to Judea and Samaria and the whole world. But they hadn't done it yet. And some commentaries mentioned that when God tells you to do something and you don't do it, suddenly there becomes more reasons to do just that thing. He, they were told to go out. Now they're going out. Uh, unfortunately, it was through the means of persecution. And it said that those who went out and those who were scattered started preaching the word. Philip went to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ. All the signs and wonders and healed and got rid of unclean spirits. It reminds me of when I'm trying to fight dandelions in my front yard. And the first thing you do is you go get the weed whacker. And when you get the weed whacker and you cut off the head of a dandelion, suddenly you have dandelion seeds going everywhere. Same thing um, with thistles and those kinds of things. You think you're taking care of the problem and instead you just made it worse. Or uh, sometimes people will talk about smacking a hive of wasps. If, as soon as you do that, it just causes them to come out and scatter everywhere. So it doesn't get the thing you wanted to do. And that, in this case, the church started bringing the message everywhere. But then it says there was a man named Simeon, and he practiced magic. Now, this magic that was being done was more like um, sorcery that we don't know if it was a cult if it was just something he was faking, or was this some sort of a demonic Satan thing that he was doing? But either way, wasn't good, right? He wasn't taking power from God. But we, we see people, you know, amazed when people can do certain things. It says that people were saying he has power from God. They called him great. And it said, on the other hand, they believed Philip also was preaching about the kingdom of God, preached the good news in the name of Jesus Christ, baptized people, men and women. And so it said that even Simon himself believed and was baptized by Philip. Let's talk a quick moment about Philip. So Philip is a guy we haven't talked about before. He is not the apostle Philip. He's not an apostle. He's not a disciple we heard of before. He was just a man who rose up from this church family, became empowered to go out and do these things and was part of this Hellenistic widow's problem trying to solve the problem that was going on. So that generation of people that took care of those widows were, were growing up in their service to the church. And now he is talking to Samaria, which most people didn't like the Samaritans. They, that long feud we've talked about time and time before, they didn't trust each other. They didn't like each other. They thought, I think, each other were not saved in the eyes of God, not loved by God. They thought they were each the true chosen people. And so now we have Philip, who rose up in this generation, went up there and spoke to the Samaritans. And even this, this sorcerer, this magi, believed in him. And it said that even the apostles in Jerusalem heard about Samaria receiving the word of God. And they sent Peter and John to go down there and pray for them so that they too may receive the Holy Spirit. For he has not yet fallen on them. And they were being baptized in the name of Jesus. Their hands were laid on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And then when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he, Simon the wizard, it's like, well, I want this power. Lay your hands on me so I can have this power. Now, I don't know if this was some sort of spiritual gift that Peter had, or he could just see it through all of it. But Peter was having none of this. 
this is ESV, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? There's, I put a question mark in, a question mark in the translation. You know, you have to realize that anytime someone reads out loud any passage, there is an interpretation to it. So they did an exclamation mark. I did a question mark, but it says, you'll have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray that the Lord, if possible, of course it's possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see in you the gall of bitterness and the bond of inequity. And Simon responded right away, you know, pray for me that all these things that you said won't come true. Peter saw right through him, saw right through his heart that it was bitterness. It was this bond of inequity. He never felt like he was maybe good enough or he wanted to be better than people. And I don't think that this is saying that he would have, if he'd dropped down to it right now, gone to hell. He's saying, though, what your thoughts are, are leading you astray, just like our thoughts lead us astray as well. But Peter recognized it right away, set Simon straight about what he was doing and what the gifts of God are. You do not obtain them by money. Now, such a good point. And now Peter and John went back to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages in this, among the Samaritans. Isn't that great? So an angel of the Lord told Philip, rise and go south and go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. There's a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch. And they were made eunuchs so that they could be trusted as court officials, as people who handled the offices of the leaders in many places. It was a common, oh, just let's just say that. And the spirits told Philip, go over there to that chariot. And so Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah, talking about this Ethiopian. It, it said that it was just a signal that this man was black and that he was from a kingdom called Nubia, Upper Nile River, like I said, somewhere parts of modern Egypt, Sudan, and Candace was the Nubian queen. She was like the pharaoh of that area. He goes over there, he's reading Isaiah. And he asks him, hey, what are you reading? I think as a conversation started, you know, do you understand what you're reading there? And the, and the eunuch says, well, how can I, you know, unless someone helps me? It's, it's complicated stuff, right? Isaiah, we'll get to that someday. How can I understand this if no one helps me with it? Because Isaiah is complicated stuff. And so the eunuch reads the pasture about the sheep being sent to the slaughter, the lamb before the shearer. He doesn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, he has deprived justice. What, what is that passage? Who's he talking about? Please tell me who the prophet is talking about. Is he talking about himself or someone else? And boy, you wanted a good introduction about let me tell you about who that is. Philip opens his mouth. It says, beginning with scripture. You know what? This is the good news of Jesus. And they were going along the road, talking, I'm sure. And the eunuch says, there's water here. What prevents me from being baptized? And so Philip baptized him. Came out of the water. You see the word of God spreading, either by the tellers spreading the message or by people coming into this land from far away and will take it back to their land. We haven't seen this happen very often in the Bible, but when the man comes out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him anymore, but rejoiced on his way. The man has the joy of God in him and he found himself in Azotus. As he passed through, he preached the gospels to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Azotus is now what we call Ashdod, which is just north of where my archaeological dig in Israel was. I was in Ashkelon. The other Philistine city was Ashdod. And so then he comes back and he preaches all the way until he goes to Caesarea. Caesarea is different, or Caesarea, sometimes they call it, is different than what you would call it um, Caesarea Philippi. That's a different place altogether. This is along the coast. It's gorgeous. There's a gigantic amphitheater there. When I was in Israel, there were concerts there that were, you know, named people. I'm just, it was just stunning that in all this time, we were still having concerts in this 
place that the Romans built. But I think that they believe that that town was the port city that most supplies went back and forth from Rome. So it was important at that time. When you read the commentaries, there were some kind of interesting discussions about all of this. And some of them were to the point that there's so many rules on baptism. And you can tell we didn't care what the water was. We didn't care how much water it was. We don't know if he was immersed, although it says he came back up out of the water. But it doesn't, there's no rules here. It is just water. And that was what was important, that when someone wants to be baptized, that is the Holy Spirit in that intention of it. The other thing that I thought was interesting, too, is, and this is just my personal opinion, I wonder if we do too much in keeping people from baptism. When I was baptized, I had to go through a course. I, I mean, I had things I had to do. And I asked my friend, you know, when, I, when we were trying to, she's my roommate, one time when we were trying to fall asleep, I said, what happens if I were to die now, between now and when I get baptized? And she says, well, I'll watch out for you. And if anything happens, I'll baptize you. And then it kind of struck me like, well, why don't we just get baptized now? Why is there a whole event around it? Now, I understand from the point of view of the pastor is he wanted the whole church to see it. He wanted it to be part of a church service. So there could be a lot of witnesses because it strengthens them too to see an adult being baptized. But in my mind, I think if anyone asked to be baptized, boy, I think we should just do it, right? But like I said, I'm not a pastor. This is just my personal opinion. But it, this whole passage kind of had me thinking about that. That ends Acts 8. What I'm going to meditate on is how people on earth will try to strike the church, strike the people of the church, even make them run for the hills. But even when they do that, the church still shares the gospel. It still spreads. In fact, I think it spreads more than when we're all comfy watching TV in our cute little houses. The church under persecution is like that dandelion with the weed whacker. It starts spreading the seeds everywhere. What I'm going to pray about is that gift of the Holy Spirit and how less formality we should maybe put behind it. That the gift of the Holy Spirit, believers in God, should be accepted. And even if they come into this being stupid like Simon, not understanding what it is. Stupid like me. I don't think I understood everything that I probably should have understood. I mean, not probably, but you know, in the whole scheme of things, I was a brand new baptizee. I didn't know everything. It's, it's taken me years to learn a lot of things. So, you know, how we shouldn't turn away people from these gifts of the Holy Spirit. But remember, they're brand new at this and they're going to need a lot of forgiveness. They're going to need a lot of explanation. I made mistakes. In my thinking, back when I just got baptized, boy, that's what I'm going to pray about, is that we understand our brand new converts a little bit uh, more kindly. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that the Holy Spirit is available to them. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are available to them. You can't buy them. You can't lead to get them. You can ask God, may I get this particular gift? And we have seen places in the Bible where God gave people certain gifts because they asked. But they don't come from certainly paying someone to give them to you. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Just so you know, my friend M, who shared the gospel with me, she was part of my conversion to Christianity. She has a blog, and it is called msgarden.com. You can find it. It's all about gardening, nature, and trying to turn your backyard into really this amazing retreat of flowers, birds, critters, everything like that. She does a fantastic job. So emsgarden.com, please, if you get a chance, take a look at that blog, see if it's for you, if you like growing flowers and that kind of thing. 